Okay, so this past Sunday was my daughter's birthday party, so I didn't really get to watch too much football this week. At least not until 425, that is, because I don't care how old you are, little girl. I've known the Eagles for much longer than I've known you, and they don't crap themselves as much as you do. But, I mean, it, it is close, to be fair. So I'm not going to go over every single game this week. And even if I did, how many of y'all really want to hear me talk about that ugly ass Titan Steelers game? Like, really, definitely not George Pickens. I will say those Euler unis were tastier than a blooming onion, though. Instead, seeing as how we're now more than halfway through the regular season, which means half of y'all are already inboxing Brett Coleman about scouting profiles, Let's go ahead and hand out some imaginary awards to a bunch of people who don't know they're getting them and probably would care less than Future does for fatherhood if they did. Okay, so the midseason Offensive Rookie of the Year award sponsored by Captain Obvious goes to Shamar Stroud over here. Like, who else, nigga? Jokes aside, CJ has had about as nice a transition to the league as you could ask a rookie QB whose game isn't nearly as reliant on running as past rookie QB sensations. Yeah, the yards and touchdowns are nice, like, <laughs> really nice. But honestly, the most impressive thing about Stroud, in my opinion, is that he doesn't turn the ball over, which to me says even as a pro football baby, he's processing information quick enough to make good decisions with the ball. And it's not like he's just throwing a bunch of check downs and screen passes either. Only nine games into his career, CJ already has a signature come from behind win in his back pocket. And y'all should know by now that that means a ton more to me than a bunch of gaudy stat lines. Because defense is practically illegal now, in my opinion, you can't win at the highest level without a quarterback. And Houston found themselves a good one. That is until Tyler Perry starts watching football, that is, and offers him the farm to star in Medea in the God-fearing light skin, man. Defensive Rookie of the Year Award sponsored by the late tiny Debo Lister goes to Jalen Baby Grizzly Bear Carter because, again, who else, nigga? Why a grizzly and not a rhino as he was dubbed by Jennifer Slade's husband? Because rhinos are dumb, man. Like trying to fry frozen chicken dumb. Like buying a timeshare dumb. Like drinking orange juice with a cheeseburger dumb. That's just effing gross. I did think about putting Devin Witherspoon here, but nah. Do you know how special a talent at D-tackle you have to be in order to not only be impactful, but become statistically one of, if not the best at your position, eight games into your career? Yeah, y'all really effed up is what I'm saying. All right, so the Passion of the Pigskin Award for the most improbable resurrection goes to the Cincinnati Burrows. Not gonna lie, I thought y'all were deader than the baby's career after seeing Burrow hobble around the backfield like he was suffering from a perpetual Charlie horse. But now look at you. Four straight wins, three of which against presumed playoff teams. And like I said before, the O-line finally realized that their job is actually to block people. Also, we got to give some love to the Bengals D. Just like that one guy who seems to always be there when his best girlfriend is having relationship problems, they're the ultimate opportunist. They're about middle of the pack in terms of yards allowed, but what they do do, just as if not better than most other teams in the league, is stop you in the red zone and take the ball away, ranking in the top 10 and 5 respectively in those categories. And listen, I personally can live with you giving up a bunch of yards between the 20s so long as you stop a score or even better, get me the ball back, I can live with the weight. Exactly. The Janet Jackson Award for the most embarrassing exposure on network television goes to the Miami Manatees. This is also probably a good time for me to take my preseason Super Bowl prediction back, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay, so in my and, and honestly everyone else's incessant slurpage of the perpetual motion machine that is the Dolphins' offense, 
We forgot one of the cardinal rules of football. If you can't outrun them, just hit them in the mouth until they cry uncle and curl up in the fetal position and await their demise. That's basically what each of the three teams in Miami's L column did, and it's kind of making Miami look a little more vulnerable than we thought. It's not that this team is soft by any means because, I mean, you can't be soft and play in the NFL. You literally won't survive. But this offense is built on timing more than it is built on physicality. That's part of why Tua's been so potent in the first, like, six or seven games of the season and why he can get the ball out so quickly. I don't want to say that the system does the work for him, but he doesn't really get asked to create the way that Allen Hurts and, yes, I'm going to say it, Justin Herbert are asked to. And I think this is still very much a playoff team and they do still have the ingredients to make a run. But with the O out of rhythm and the D being average on his best days, I'm not putting any bets in on them making it to the big dance. Or at least I wish I hadn't already. God damn it, Mike. Speaking of McDaniel, or I guess McDaniels in this case, the incriminating photo keeper award goes to Josh McDaniels because how the F else do you explain this man keep getting hired as a head coach? I'm not going to bother documenting McDaniels' dickheadry because if you watch this channel, chances are you probably watch Flem and Perna as well or any of the other sports YouTubers who've already covered it. But there's no way on God's great earth that you can look at this man's track record of not only drafting poorly, not only failing to develop the players he probably shouldn't have drafted where he did in the first place, not only forcing his personnel to fit into his scheme, regardless of if their skill set suits said scheme or not, not only not listening to that personnel suggestions on how to better maximize their skills in that stupid scheme, not only alienating his best players and effectively forcing them out of town because his ego is too big to fit inside the damn stadium, but not even having the win-loss record to justify any of that and say, yeah, this is the guy we want to lead our long language legacy franchise back to relevancy. Well, I mean, if you're the same guy who thinks this haircut is okay for a grown ass man, then yeah, it, it makes sense. The I apologize, I was not familiar with your game award goes to the Minnesota Vikings. Even before Big Kirko's ACL snapped like a Slim Jim, get well soon, Kurt. I said this team's 2022 season was more fluky than a tender match for DJ Academics. And yeah, the 23 team might not be a slam dunk for the playoffs like last year's, but they are getting dubs, almost and probably so. And at the end of the day, that's the only stat that really matters. Just get in and win one game after another, after another, and before you know it, you're in the big dance somehow. That's basically the 07 and 2011 Giants in a nutshell. That's part of why football is my favorite sport. Practically every moment from opening kickoff to the last seconds of garbage time in week 17 matter in some capacity. Your best guys don't get to take games off in the middle of the season because your entire season could flip with one bad decision or step out of bounds. Yeah, more on that later. And this Vikings team, man, if nothing else, is gutty. And I can respect that. I can respect that they've been playing without their star receiver for a chunk of the season and still stayed in it. I can respect that they went down 0-3 and the whole football world wrote them off and they didn't write back. And I can respect that they just won a game with a quarterback who's been there so long that he didn't even know the last names of most of the guys he was throwing to. I apologize, Minnesota. I was not familiar with your game. Y'all still probably going to get bounced in the wild card round, but at least y'all not going to go out like chumps like the Giants. The Stubborn as a Mule Award goes to Robert the Rock Stunt Double. I seriously did consider giving him Coach of the Year for gutting out these ugly-ass wins, including the lone blemish on the Eagles record thus far, but seriously, y'all, how can you look at at this team, specifically his offense, and not think about how much better they'd be with practically anyone besides Zach Wilson under center. And listen, I'm not saying that it's all Zach's fault because the O is basically just Brees, Garrett, and nothing else. And the line is going through more bodies than Wilt Chamberlain. 
But come on, man. This right here is the NFL equivalent of a fast break layup. You cannot miss this throw as a pro quarterback. And Zach does it way too often at this point in his career for me to believe that he could get significantly better. Like, I get it. You're basically married to Aaron's 40-year-old ACL, so trading for a quality starter wasn't going to be realistic. And you're just trying to tread water until enough time has passed for him to defy any and all conventional medical wisdom and lead you to the promised land. Yeah, good luck with that. But Matt Ryan, Nick Foles, and I mean, damn, even Carson Wentz are all a call away. Each one of them, in my opinion, is a better option than Zach the MILF milker. I don't know, man. Maybe that's the reason Salah is so married to him. Because not going to lie, if a nigga like that was in striking distance of becoming my stepdaddy, I'd probably let him get hit for 60 minutes every week also. The Samwise Gamgee's Shared the Load Award goes to the Baltimore Ravens defense and running game. This was honestly the only reason I didn't think that the Ravens would make much noise once the clock struck January. That and the injuries, to be honest. And yeah, Edgar Allan Poe's perpetual emo energy is still hovering over Charm City because, I mean, how else do you explain all of these injuries? But despite all of that, the Ravens are still number one in points allowed on defense and number one in rushing yards per game on offense. But what should be even more encouraging for Ravens fans is they're still putting up the six most points per game despite having a bottom tier passing O right now. The reason I think that's more cause for praise than panic is because we've already seen that Lamar can more than take over a game if and when it's needed. But that's the thing. The last two or three weeks, he hasn't needed to do that. He's just playing good, efficient ball and letting the rest of the team do the heavy lifting. And for the first time in his career, Lamar Jackson is a, dare I say it, a game manager. Don't you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. Don't you put that on us. Point being, the Ravens can beat you in a ton of different ways. And you have to account for all of them if you find yourself on the opposing sideline. This team is going to be a problem come January. And at this point, I would not be surprised to see them in Vegas. All right, so the one-armed Kamehameha Award for gutsiest performance has to go to Jalen Hurts, man. From week one, he hasn't looked like quite the dynamic runner he was the last two seasons. And now we know why. Reports were that it's a bone bruise, and I don't know how true that is, but I do know that he's dealing with something. And I also know that getting hit with a helmet in your kneecap hurts worse than seeing your girl's Halloween party pictures. But whatever it is, it's bothered him enough that he's morphed into almost a pure pocket passer this season in order to compensate for that lack of running dynamism. Dyna lack of running well. Damn it, nigga which is actually kind of better than anything you could hope for in this situation, honestly. It's like the worse that that knee has gotten, the better he's actually played, to the point that halfway through the season, in a year in which no one has really separated themselves from the pack, I think you gotta put him in the MVP conversation. The Hold My Beer Award for team most likely to lose a game due to perpetual brain fart syndrome is the Dallas Cowboys. Listen, Y'all really should have beaten the Eagles. And y'all probably would have if McCarthy had taken the points instead of going for it here, which, to be honest, I'm not that mad at. But y'all also failed to convert another time in the second half. What I'm really mad about, though, is Dak having the situational awareness of a side piece at a family gathering. In a gotta-have-it situation like this, you just have to know where the boundary is. You have to, man. And perhaps worse than that, when you get gifted as many yards as Dallas was by the Eagles' D, both in penalties and just by virtue of playing like straight ass, this much ass, and you have a shot to not only win the game, but break the heart of every man, woman, and child from Trenton, New Jersey to Wilmington, Delaware, and back in one fell swoop, you can't take a sack here, bucko. And even if you do, you have to clock the ball as soon as you line back up. And even if you don't do that, you have to throw the ball to the end zone. 
not like five yards short of it. It's her der moments like this that have plagued this Dallas team for basically the entirety of McCarthy's tenure. And that's on McCarthy. I'm a firm believer that teams take on the personality of their coach. And if your coach is a walking dirt moment in clutch situations, the team is just going to follow suit. I'm sorry that I'm not sorry that this is y'all's coach, Dallas. Okay, so now let me give y'all my midseason predictions for the rest of the year. Pat Mahomes is going to win MVP for the trillionth time, and the award might as well be named after him at that point. A.J. Brown is going to win Offensive Player of the Year, and T.J. Watt is going to be Defensive Player. Buffalo will miss the playoffs because why not? Arizona is going to finish with the worst record and the number one pick, but they will not select the quarterback. Instead, they'll trade that pick to, wait for it, New England, who will then select Drake May number one overall because ain't no way Bill Belichick didn't cringe and seethe simultaneously at the sight of seeing a 21-year-old kid showing any sign of emotion after losing one of the most important and hard-fought rivalry games of his career. I don't know. I'm just grasping at straws here. But anyway, playoff predictions. Philly goes 4-2 and two through that off-disgust hell stretch, splitting with Dallas and losing to the Chiefs, but wind up sewing up the number one seed before week 17 anyway. Baltimore wins the number one seed in the AFC and end up riding that momentum all the way to the AFC championship game, where they will then lose to the Chiefs, who will go on to Vegas to meet the Eagles after a hard-fought NFC championship win over the Detroit Lions. So, yeah, for the first time in so long, I didn't even bother to look it up. We get a Super Bowl rematch for the ages with the Eagles ultimately coming out on top because somebody actually bothered to put down decent grass this time around.